457, Chapter 81 of The Count of Monte Cristo. Book talk begins at 1129. Welcome to Craftlit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 457, Sassenach. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. I hope you are well. I am well because it is a full 10 degrees cooler than it is supposed to be this morning as I am recording. And, and well, that rhymed. It's been lovely. The skies are blue. The days are sunny. And today I have a chapter that could be called Three Nasty Men. (laughs) Somehow it doesn't seem to fit the weather, but it's great for us as a chapter. But for those who have read the Diana Gabaldon books and know the meaning of the word Sassanach, I bring you good tidings of great joy because Diane and I are finally ready to announce the next Craftlet tour. We are going to Scotland, and we're going to Scotland in June of 2018. We decided to switch up the timing a little bit because we know that that the fall, October time is not always the most convenient for people. We are hoping that the date we have in June will be good, good for you, good for your family, good for your friends, good for traveling. Diane has been to Scotland so many times in the last year. It really was a no-brainer that this is where we needed to go to next. There will be a lot more details to come. And I will do little highlight tours of many of the places that we are going to visit. A quick overview will be in Glasgow, in Edinburgh, in Glams, in Lilt to see the working dogs. So we'll get a sheep dog experience, which you know I love. Distillery, yay, falconry. And of course, because it is a holiday travel vacation, there will be time off so that you can go and explore some on your own. We will be staying in, as you know, excellent hotels that are near city centers or at least centers of interest, so that if you do decide to hang back, you can go do stuff. You don't have to hassle yourself to get anywhere and go look at things that you haven't seen before. That means that if you've been to Scotland before, you should still take a look at what we're offering. Because I've been before, I thought I saw a lot of Scotland, I haven't been to a lot of the places that Diane has found for us. There will be a link to the e-brochure both from this episode at craftlit.com slash 457. There will also be, God willing and the creeks don't rise, a button with, as Diane calls them, her healing cows. There are pictures of highland cows on the, the button that you will see in the sidebar. Again, as long as I don't screw up the website again. People who have traveled with us before, you have a $100 per person coupon. If you have lost the paper copy, fear not. Holiday Vacations has your information. They know whether you've used it or not. So you'll be able to apply that to this trip. For those of you who haven't traveled with us before on a Craftlet tour, all it takes to reserve your space is $200 deposit. That $200 deposit is fully refundable until the due date for the final payment which I think is somewhere around March 18th in 2018. So you've got lots of time to plan and get ready and get your things together so that we can go to Scotland together. (sighs) If you want to take a look at the information over on the holiday travel website, all you have to do is go to www.holidayvacations.com and use keyword craft, C-R-A-F-T. If our brochure, for some reason, isn't up the second that you listen to this podcast and get this information, it will be up shortly. You are more than welcome to look through previous holiday vacation 
travel catalogs and see the amazing itineraries that they use just in general, and then know that ours will be finely tailored for our relentlessly curious natures. Thank you, Diane. If you know already that you want to go and it's it, you're done, you're ready, your bags are packed, you're chomping at the bit, I'm talking to you, Kathy, then all you have to do is phone 1-800-826-2266 and ask to speak to Diane Reed Jackson. And if she isn't available, you can speak to somebody else. They will have our information as well. However, I certainly understand if you decide to call back so you can just talk to Diane. Because it's always fun. All right. So that was that housekeeping. Crafty chat from this week. I had a lot of really cool things to share from listeners. One of them from listener Robin was a, a web page that I'm linking to from the show notes of 100 year old color photographs. These are not hand tinted photographs. This was a, a guy in France who was doing experimental photography. As far as I recall, I read the page really quickly. Amazing. Uh, uh, the colors are amazing. What people wore was amazing. How much easier it is to see the texture of the fabric. You can really tell what people were making their clothes out of because of the color. Who knew? You probably did. But still, wow, really, really beautiful. Haunting in many cases. But I mean, they're so gorgeous. It was the kind of thing where I thought, wow, I wonder if if I printed that out on nice photo paper, could I frame it? That's gorgeous. So that was one thing I wanted to share with you. The other is last week, previous Crafty Chat, AT was in the chat room with me and I was talking about fonts and hand lettering and playing with different fonts in my bullet journal. And that I'd, I mentioned that I'd had a hard time finding font books that were for hand lettering, not just font books for using with typesetting type programs. A.T. mentioned that she was a font junkie, and she recommended a particular book. I purchased said book, and I got it used on Amazon, which was always a fun thing, especially when it's coming in as a used book, but it doesn't look used to me. It is called The Joy of Lettering, A Creative Exploration of Contemporary Hand Lettering, Typography, and Illustrated Typeface. This is by Walter Foster, and it is still largely, in many ways, a font book that you could use for desktop publishing. However, in the opening pages, and mind you, I've only read the opening pages, the very beginning of this book, because I want to sit down and read it when I have time. And yes, you heard me. I want to sit and read it because it had little interesting factoids. Like, you know, it starts with the elements of letters like here's a serif, and here's uppercase, and here's lowercase, and here's a crossbar, and here's the ascender, and here's the descender, and, and stuff. If you've played with calligraphy, you know these things. But then I came to the page, which I showed on the Crafty Chat. So if you follow the link in the show notes, it will take you to the YouTube video to this location where I show this page. Because the page spread on pages 20 and 21 shows the Garamond font. This is a font that you're probably familiar with. It's in, at least with Macintoshes, it comes as an installed font. I've always liked Garamond, and now I know why. It is a purposefully imperfect font. It's a serif font, so it has little fiddly bits. It has kind of the old school typewriter G, the one that's like a circle with a wiggle with a circle below it. Garamond, according to this book, the letters have been designed, and he describes them as to be beautifully imperfect. The serif on the bottom of the letters, not all of them, but many of them, one side of that base serif is longer, but they're also formed slightly differently. In his examples, he shows there's a, a lowercase r. It's a very pretty little r. The left side of the letter, as you descend to that bottom serif, it curves kind of like a skateboard ramp at a skate park. It's a, a fairly decent curve. The other side, the right-hand side edge of the R as it descends from the little R bar, the outcropping that lets you know it's a little lowercase r. As you go down that right-hand side, when it meets the serif, it meets almost in a right angle. It's a tiny little bit oblique, not a perfect right angle, not perfect. And that serif extends a little bit more 
than the other serif does, or at least it appears to because of the way that the serifs are formed. Fascinating. I had no idea, but it sure makes sense to me why I would be attracted to that font. It feels a little older, a little more bookish, a little less techy, and we of the book-loving population, I have a feeling a lot of us are drawn to things like that, like old bookstore smells and old book fonts. These things are really cool. So huge thanks to AT. Not only did I have a good time looking at the book and <laughs> and then I had to steal it back from my son in order to have it here to talk about for you, but he, my my thing one, my thing one who's going to a pre-college program for a month this summer, <sighs> and he's going to an art university, he picked this up. I showed it to him. And at first he said, mom, you know, I don't do hand lettering. And then I showed him that Garamond page and he said, I'll be taking that now. And he literally did walk off with my book. So I have stolen it back. So links to the YouTube video of the Crafty Chat will be at craftlit.com slash 457. That way you can see the 100-year-old pictures that I shared. You can also see what the page spread looks like in the Joy of Lettering book briefly. And we'll also have links out to an Amazon link for the Joy of Lettering book and the link directly to the page that has the 100-year-old photos. All of that at craftlit.com slash 457. Okay, book talk. Here we go. There isn't any. Seriously, there is absolutely nothing for me to talk to you about. It is three nasty men. <laughs> we, we start with one duo of nasty men, and then one of them leaves and goes and talks to another nasty guy. And then they talk about nasty things because they're nasty men. And I don't mean nasty in any modern sense. I mean, these are mean, despicable, unpleasant, devious, petulant people. Nasty people. So, rah, rah. so I'm going to let you go. Listen, and there, there won't be much for me to say on the flip side either because you'll see. All right, here we go. Chapter 81 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 81. The Room of the Retired Baker. The evening of the day on which the Count of Morcerf had left Donglar's house with feelings of shame and anger at the rejection of the projected alliance, Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti, with curled hair, moustaches in perfect order, and white gloves which fitted admirably, had entered the courtyard of the banker's house in La Chaussée d'Antin. He had not been more than ten minutes in the drawing-room before he drew Danglars aside into the recess of a bow window, and, after an ingenious preamble, related to him all his anxieties and cares since his noble father's departure. He acknowledged the extreme kindness which had been shown him by the banker's family, in which he had been received as a son, and where, besides his warmest affections, had found an object on which to centre in Mademoiselle Danglars. Danglars listened with the most profound attention. He had expected this declaration for the last two or three days, and when at last it came his eyes glistened as much as they had lowered on listening to Morcerf. He would not, however, yield immediately to the young man's request, but made a few conscientious objections. "'Are you not rather young, Monsieur Andrea, to think of marrying?' "'I think not, sir,' replied Monsieur Cavalcanti. In Italy, the nobility generally marry young. A life is so uncertain that we ought to secure happiness while it is within our reach. Well, sir, said Danglars, in case your proposals, which do me honour, are accepted by my wife and daughter, by whom shall the preliminary arrangements be settled? So important a negotiation should, I think, be conducted by the respective fathers of the young people. "'Sir, my father is a man of great foresight and prudence. "'Thinking that I might wish to settle in France, "'he left me at his departure together with the papers establishing my identity, "'a letter promising, if he approved of my choice, "'one hundred and fifty thousand livres per annum from the day I was married. "'So far as I can judge, I suppose this to be a quarter of my father's revenue.' "'Aye,' said Danglars. 
have always intended giving my daughter five hundred thousand francs as her dowry. She is, besides, my sole heiress. All would then be easily arranged if the baroness and her daughter are willing. We should command an annuity of one hundred and seventy-five thousand livres. Supposing also I should persuade the marquis to give me my capital, which is not likely, but still is possible, we would place these two or three million in your hands, whose talent might make it realize ten per cent. I never give more than four per cent, and generally only three and a half. But to my son-in-law I would give five, and we would share the profit. Very good, father-in-law, said Cavalcanti, yielding to his low-born nature which would escape sometimes through the aristocratic gloss with which he sought to conceal it. Correcting himself immediately, he said, "'Excuse me, sir. Hope alone makes me almost mad. What will not reality do?' "'But,' said Donglar, who on his heart did not perceive how soon the conversation which was at first disinterested was turning to a business transaction, "'there is doubtless a part of your fortune your father could not refuse you.' "'Which?' asked the young man. "'That you inherit from your mother. "'Truly from my mother, Leonora Cosinari. "'How much may it amount to?' "'Indeed, sir,' said Andrea. "'I assure you, I have never given the subject a thought, "'but I suppose it must have been at least two millions.' "'Donglar felt as much overcome with joy as the miser who finds a lost treasure, "'or as the shipwrecked mariner who feels himself on solid ground.' instead of in the abyss which he expected would swallow him up. "'Well, sir,' said Andrea, bowing to the banker respectfully, "'may I hope?' "'You may not only hope,' said Donglar, "'but consider it a settled thing, if no obstacle arises on your part.' "'I am indeed rejoiced,' said Andrea. "'But,' said Donglar thoughtfully, "'How is it that your patron, Monsieur de Monte Cristo, did not make his proposal for you?' Andrea blushed imperceptibly. "'I have just left the Count, sir,' said he. "'He is, doubtless, a delightful man, but inconceivably peculiar in his ideas. He esteems me highly. He even told me he had not the slightest doubt that my father would give me the capital instead of the interest of my property.' he has promised to use his influence to obtain it for me but he also declared that he never had taken on himself the responsibility of making proposals for another and he never would i must however do him the justice to add that he assured me if ever he had regretted the repugnance he felt to such a step it was on this occasion because he thought the projected union would be a happy and a suitable one besides if he will do nothing officially "'He will answer any questions you propose to him. "'And now,' continued he with one of his most charming smiles, "'having finished talking to the father-in-law, "'I must address myself to the banker.' "'And what may you have to say to him?' said Donglar, laughing in his turn. "'That the day after to-morrow I shall have to draw upon you for about four thousand francs. "'But the Count,' expecting my bachelor's revenue could not suffice for the coming month's outlay, has offered me a draft for twenty thousand francs. It bears his signature, as you see, which is all sufficient. "'Bring me a million such as that,' said Donglar. "'I shall be well pleased,' putting the draft in his pocket. "'Fix your own hour for to-morrow, and my cashier shall call on you with a cheque for eighty thousand francs.' "'At ten o'clock, then, if you please. "'I should like it early, as I am going into the country to-morrow.' "'Very well. "'At ten o'clock you are still at the Hôtel des Princes?' "'Yes.' "'The following morning, with the banker's usual punctuality, "'the eighty thousand francs were placed in the young man's hands "'as he was on the point of starting, "'after having left two hundred francs for Caderousse. "'He went out chiefly to avoid this dangerous enemy.' and returned as late as possible in the evening. But scarcely had he stepped out of his carriage when the porter met him with a parcel in his hand. "'Sir,' said he, 
That man has been here. What man? said Andrea carelessly, apparently forgetting him whom he but too well recollected. Him to whom your excellency pays that little annuity. Oh, said Andrea, my father's old servant. Well, you gave him the two hundred francs I had left for him. Yes, your excellency. Andrea had expressed a wish to be thus addressed. But, continued the porter, he would not take them. Andrea turned pale, but as it was dark his pallor was not perceptible. What, he would not take them? said he with slight emotion. No, he wished to speak to your excellency. I told him you were gone out, and after some dispute he believed me and gave me this letter, which he had brought with him already sealed. Give it to me, said Andrea, and he read by the light of his carriage lamp. You know where I live. I expect you tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Andrea examined it carefully to ascertain if the letter had been opened, or if any indiscreet eyes had seen its contents. But it was so carefully folded that no one could have read it, and the seal was perfect. Very well, said he. Poor man, he is a worthy creature. He left the porter to ponder on these words not knowing which most to admire, the master or the servant. "'Take out the horses quickly, and come up to me,' said Andrea to his groom. In two seconds the young man had reached his room and burnt Caderousse's letter. The servant entered just as he had finished. "'You are about my height, Pierre,' said he. "'I have that honour, Your Excellency.' "'You have a new livery yesterday.' "'Yes, sir.' I have an engagement with a pretty little girl for this evening, and do not wish to be known. Lend me your livery till to-morrow. I may sleep, perhaps, at an inn. Pierre obeyed. Five minutes after, Andrea left the hotel, completely disguised, took a cabriolet, and ordered the driver to take him to the Cheval Rouge at Picpus. The next morning he left that inn, as he had left the Hôtel de Prince, without being noticed walked down the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, along the boulevard to Rue Menilmontant, and stopped at the door of the third house on the left, looking for some one of whom to make inquiry in the porter's absence. "'For whom are you looking, my fine fellow?' asked the fruiteress on the opposite side. "'Monsieur Payatin, if you please, my good woman,' replied Andrea. "'A retired baker?' asked the fruiteress. "'Exactly.' He lives at the end of the yard on the left, on the third story. Andrea went as she directed him, and on the third floor he found a hare's paw, which by the hasty ringing of the bell it was evident he pulled with considerable ill-temper. A moment after Caderousse's face appeared at the grating in the door. "'Ah, you are punctual,' said he, as he drew back the door. "'Confound you and your punctuality,' said Andrea throwing himself into a chair in a manner which implied that he would rather have flung it at the head of his host. "'Come, come, my little fellow, don't be angry. See, I have thought about you. Look at the good breakfast we are going to have. Nothing but what you are fond of.' Andrea, indeed, inhaled the scent of something cooking which was not unwelcome to him, hungry as he was. It was that mixture of fat and garlic peculiar to provincial kitchens of an inferior order, added to that of dried fish, and above all the pungent smell of musk and cloves. These odours escaped from two deep dishes which were covered and placed on a stove, and from a copper pan placed in an old iron pot. In an adjoining room Andrea saw also a tolerably clean table prepared for two, two bottles of wine sealed, the one with green, the other with yellow, a supply of brandy in a decanter, and a measure of fruit in a cabbage leaf, cleverly arranged on an earthenware plate. "'What do you think of it, my little fellow?' said Caderousse. "'Ah, that smells good. You know I used to be a famous cook. Do you recollect how you used to lick your fingers? You are among the first who tasted any of my dishes, and I think you relish them tolerably.' While speaking, Caderousse went on peeling a fresh supply of onions. "'But,' said Andrea ill-temperedly, "'by my faith, 
if it was only to breakfast with you that you disturbed me i wish the devil had taken you my boy said caderousse sententiously one can talk while eating and then you ungrateful being you are not pleased to see an old friend i am weeping with joy he was truly crying but it would have been difficult to say whether joy or the onions produced the greatest effect on the lacrimal glands of the old innkeeper of the pont du gard hold your tongue you hypocrite said andrea you love me yes i do or make the devil take me i know it is a weakness said caderousse but it overpowers me and yet it has not prevented your sending for me to play me some trick come said caderousse wiping his large knife on his apron if i do not like you do you think i should endure the wretched life you lead me think for a moment you have your servant clothes on you therefore keep a servant i have none and am obliged to prepare my own meals you abuse my cookery because you dine at the table d'hote of the hotel des princes or the cafe de paris well i too could keep a servant i too could have a tilbury i too could dine where i like but why do i not because i would not annoy my little benedetto come just acknowledge that i could eh this address was accompanied by a look which was by no means difficult to understand well said andrea admitting your love why do you want me to breakfast with you that i may have the pleasure of seeing you my little fellow what is the use of seeing me after we have made all our arrangements hey dear friend said caderousse are wills ever made without codicils but you first came to breakfast did you not well sit down and let us begin with these pilchards and this fresh butter which i have put on some vine leaves to please you wicked one ah yes you look at my room my four straw chairs my image three francs each but what do you expect this is not the hotel des princes come you are growing discontented you are no longer happy you who only wish to live like a retired baker caderousse sighed well what have you to say you have seen your dream realized i can still say it is a dream a retired baker my poor benedetto is rich he has an annuity well you have an annuity i have yes since i bring you your two hundred franc caderousse shrugged his shoulders it is humiliating said he thus to receive money given grudgingly an uncertain supply which may soon fail you see i am obliged to economize in case your prosperity should cease well my friend fortune is inconstant as the chaplain of the regiment said i know your prosperity is great you rascal you are to marry the daughter of Donglar. what of Donglar? yes to be sure must i say baron Donglar? i might as well say count benedetto he was an old friend of mine and if he had not so bad a memory he ought to invite me to your wedding seeing he came to mine yes yes to mine god he was not so proud then he was an under clerk to the good monsieur morel i have dined many times with him and the count of morcerf so you see i have some high connections and were i to cultivate them a little we might meet in the same drawing-rooms come your jealousy represents everything to you in the wrong light that is all very fine benedetto mio but i know what i am saying perhaps i may one day put on my best coat and presenting myself at the great gate introduce myself meanwhile let us sit down and eat caderousse set the example and attacked the breakfast with good appetite praising each dish he set before his visitor the latter seemed to have resigned himself he drew the corks and partook largely of the fish with the garlic and fat ah mate said caderousse you are getting on better terms with your old landlord faith yes replied andrea whose hunger prevailed over every other feeling so you like it you rogue so much that i wonder how a man who can cook thus can complain of hard living do you see said caderousse 
all my happiness is marred by one thought. And what is that? That I am dependent on another, I who have always gained my own livelihood honestly. Do not let that disturb you. I have enough for two. No, truly, uh, you may believe me if you will. At the end of every month I am tormented by remorse. Good Caderousse! So much so that yesterday I would not take the two hundred francs. Yes, you wish to speak to me. But was it indeed remorse? Tell me. True remorse, and besides, an idea had struck me. Andrea shuddered. He always did so at Caderousse's ideas. It is miserable, do you see? Always to wait till the end of the month. Oh, said Andrea philosophically, determined to watch his companion narrowly. Does not life pass in waiting? Do I, for instance, fare better? Well, I wait patiently, do I not? Yes, because instead of expecting two hundred wretched francs, you expect five or six thousand, perhaps ten, perhaps even twelve, for you take care not to let anyone know the utmost. Down there, you always had little presents and Christmas boxes which you tried to hide from your poor friend Caderousse. Fortunately, he is a cunning fellow, that friend Caderousse. There you are beginning again to ramble, to talk again and again of the past. But what is the use of teasing me with going all over that again? Ah, you are only one and twenty and can forget the past. I am fifty and am obliged to recollect it. But let us return to business. Yes. I was going to say, if I were in your place. Well? I would realize. How would you realize? I would ask for six months in advance, under pretense of being able to purchase a farm. Then with my six months I would decamp. Well, well, said Andrea, that isn't a bad idea. My dear friend, said Caderousse, eat of my bread and take my advice. You'll be none the worse off, physically or morally. But, said Andrea, why do you not act on the advice you gave me? Why do you not realize a six months, a year's advance even, and retire to Brussels? Instead of leaving the retired baker, you might live as a bankrupt, using his privileges, that would be very good. But how the devil would you have me retire on twelve hundred francs? Ah, Caderousse, said Andrea, how covetous you are. Two months ago you were dying with hunger. The appetite grows by what it feeds on said Caderousse, grinning, and showing his teeth like a monkey, laughing or a tiger growling. And, added he, biting off with his large white teeth an enormous mouthful of bread, I have formed a plan. Caderousse's plans alarmed Andrea still more than his ideas. Ideas were but the germ. The plan was reality. Let me see your plan. I dare say it is a pretty one. Why not? who formed the plan by which we left the establishment of— Eh, was it not I, and was no bad one, I believe, since here we are? I do not say, replied Andrea, that you never make a good one, but let us see your plan. Well, pursued Caderousse, can you, without expending one sou, put me in the way of getting fifteen thousand francs? No, fifteen thousand are not enough— I cannot again become an honest man with less than thirty thousand francs. No, replied Andrea dryly. No, I cannot. I do not think you understand me, replied Caderousse calmly. I said without your laying out a sou. Do you want me to commit a robbery, to spoil all my good fortune and yours with mine, and both of us to be dragged down there again? It would make very little difference to me said Caderousse. If I were retaken, I am a poor creature to live alone, and sometimes pine for my old comrades, not like you, heartless creature, who would be glad never to see them again. Andrea did more than tremble this time. He turned pale. Come, Caderousse, no nonsense, said he. Don't alarm yourself, my little Benedetto, but to just point out to me some means of gaining those thirty thousand francs without your assistance, and I will contrive it. 
"'Well, I'll see. "'I'll try to contrive some way,' said Andrea. "'Meanwhile, you raise my monthly allowance to five hundred francs, my little fellow. "'I have a fancy and mean to get a housekeeper.' "'Well, you shall have your five hundred francs,' said Andrea. "'But it is very hard for me, my poor Caderousse. "'You take advantage.' "'Bah!' said Caderousse. "'When you have access to countless stores.' One would have said Andre anticipated his companion's words, so did his eye flash like lightning. But it was but for a moment. True, he replied, and my protector is very kind. That dear protector, said Caderousse, and how much does he give you monthly? Five thousand francs. As many thousands as you give me hundreds. Truly, it is only bastards who are thus fortunate. Five thousand francs per month. What the devil can you do with all that? Oh, it is no trouble to spend that. And I'm like you. I want capital. Capital. Yes, I understand. Everyone would like capital. Well, and I shall get it. Who will give it to you? Your prince? Yes, my prince. But unfortunately, I must wait. You must wait for what? asked Caderousse. "'For his death.' "'The death of your prince?' "'Yes.' "'How so?' "'Because he has made his will in my favour. "'Indeed. "'On my honour. "'For how much?' "'For five hundred thousand. "'Only that? "'It's little enough. "'But so it is. "'No, it cannot be. "'Are you my friend, Caderousse?' "'Yes, in life or death. "'Well, I will tell you a secret. "'What is it? "'But remember. "'Ah, pardieu, mute as a carp. "'Well, I think.' "'Andrea stopped and looked around. "'You think? "'Do not fear, pardieu, we are alone. "'I think I have discovered my father.' "'Your true father?' "'Yes.' "'Not old Cavalcanti?' "'No, for he has gone again. "'The true one, as you say. "'And what father is? "'Well, Caderousse, it is Monte Cristo. Ah. "'Yes, you understand, that explains all. "'He cannot acknowledge me openly, it appears, "'but he does it through Monsieur Cavalcanti, "'and gives him fifty thousand francs for it. Fifty thousand francs for being your father? "'I would have done it for half that.' "'For twenty thousand, for fifteen thousand. "'Why did you not think of me, ungrateful man? "'Did I know anything about it, "'when it was all done when I was down there? "'Ah, truly, and you say that by his will. "'He leaves me five hundred thousand livres. "'Are you sure of it? "'He showed it to me. "'But that is not all. "'There is a codicil, as I said just now. "'Probably.' "'and in that codicil he acknowledges me. "'Oh, the good father, the brave father, the very honest father,' "'said Caderousse, twirling a plate in the air between his two hands. "'Now say if I conceal anything from you. "'No, and your confidence makes your honourable in my opinion, "'and your princely father, is he rich? Very rich? "'Yes, he is that. "'He does not himself know the amount of his fortune.' "'Is it possible?' "'It is evident enough to me, who am always at his house. "'The other day a banker's clerk brought him fifty thousand francs in a portfolio about the size of your plate. "'Yesterday his banker brought him a hundred thousand francs in gold.' Caderousse was filled with wonder. "'The young man's words sounded to him like metal, and he thought he could hear the rushing of cascades of Louis. "'And you go into that house?' cried he briskly. "'When I like.' Caderousse was thoughtful for a moment. It was easy to perceive he was revolving some unfortunate idea in his mind. Then suddenly, "'How I should like to see all that!' cried he. "'How beautiful it must be!' "'It is, in fact, magnificent,' said Andrea. "'And does he not live in the Champs-Élysées?' "'Yes, number thirty. "'Ah!' said Caderousse. "'Numero trente. 
"'Yes, a fine house, standing alone, between a courtyard and a garden. "'You must know it.' "'Possibly. But it is not the exterior I care for, it is the interior. "'What beautiful furniture there must be in it.' "'Have you ever seen the Tuileries?' "'No. Well, it surpasses that.' It must be worth one's while to stoop, Andrea, when that good Monsieur Monte Cristo lets fall his purse. It is not worth while to wait for that, said Andrea. Money is as plentiful in that house as fruit in an orchard. But you should take me there one day with you. How can I? On what plea? You are right, but you have made my mouth water. I must absolutely see it. I shall find a way. "'No nonsense, Caderousse. "'I will offer myself as floor-polisher. "'The rooms are all carpeted. "'Well, then, I must be contented to imagine it. "'That is the best plan, believe me. "'Try at least to give me an idea of what it is. "'How can I? "'Nothing is easier. "'Is it large? "'Middling. "'How is it arranged?' "'Faith, I should require pen, ink, and paper to make a plan.' "'They are all here,' said Caderousse briskly. He fetched from an old secretary a sheet of white paper and pen and ink. "'Here,' said Caderousse, "'draw me all that on the paper, my boy.' Andrea took the pen with an imperceptible smile and began. "'The house, as I said, is between the court and the garden. "'In this way, do you see?' Andrea drew the garden, the court, and the house. High walls? Not more than eight or ten feet. That is not prudent, said Caderousse. In the court are orange trees in pots, turf, and clumps of flowers. And no steel traps? No. The stables? Are on either side of the gate, which you see there. And Andrea continued his plan. Let us see the ground floor said Caderousse. "'On the ground floor, dining-room, two drawing-rooms, billiard-rooms, staircase in the hall, and a little black staircase. Windows? Magnificent windows, so beautiful, so large, that I believe a man of your size should pass through each frame. Why the devil have they any stairs with such windows? Luxury has everything. But shutters? Yes, but they are never used. "'That Count of Monte Cristo is an original who loves to look at the sky, even at night. "'And where do the servants sleep?' "'Oh, they have a house to themselves. "'Picture to yourself a pretty coach-house at the right-hand side, where the ladders are kept. "'Well, over that coach-house are the servants' rooms, with bells corresponding with the different apartments. "'Ah, diable! Bells, did you say? "'What do you mean?' "'Oh, nothing.' "'I only say they cost a load of money to hang. "'And what is the use of them, I should like to know? "'There used to be a dog let loose in the yard at night, "'but it has been taken to the house at Auteuil. "'To that you went to, you know?' "'Yes.' "'I was saying to him only yesterday, "'You are imprudent, Monsieur Count, "'for when you go to Auteuil and take your servants, "'the house is left unprotected.' "'Well,' said he, "'what next?' "'Well, next some day you will be robbed.' "'What did he answer?' "'He quietly said, "'What do I care if I am?' "'Andrea, he has some secretary with a spring.' "'How do you know?' "'Yes, which catches the thief in a trap and plays a tune. "'I was told there was such at the last exhibition. "'He has a simple a mahogany secretary in which the key is always kept.' "'And he is not robbed?' "'No. His servants are all devoted to him.' "'There ought to be some money in that secretary.' "'There may be. No one knows what there is.' "'And where is it?' "'On the first floor. "'Sketch me the plan of that floor, as you have done of the ground floor, my boy.' "'That is very simple.' Andrea took the pen. "'On the first story, do you see... "'There is the anteroom and the drawing-room. "'To the right of the drawing-room, a library and a study. "'To the left, a bedroom and a dressing-room. "'The famous secretary is in the dressing-room. "'Is there a window in the dressing-room? Two. 
one here and one there andrea sketched two windows in the room which formed an angle on the plan and appeared as a small square added to the rectangle of the bedroom caderousse became thoughtful does he often go to a toy added he two or three times a week to-morrow for instance he is going to spend the day and night there are you sure of it he has invited me to dine there there's a life for you said caderousse a town-house and a country-house that is what it is to be rich and shall you dine there probably when you dine there do you sleep there if i like i am at home there caderousse looked at the young man as if to get at the truth from the bottom of his heart but andrea drew a cigar case from his pocket took a havana quietly lit it and began smoking when do you want your twelve hundred francs said he to caderousse now if you have them andrea took five and twenty louis from his pocket yellow boys said caderousse no i thank you oh you despise them on the contrary i esteem them but will not have them you can change them idiot gold is worth five sous exactly and he who changes them will follow friend caderousse lay hands on him and demand what farmers pay him their rent in gold no nonsense my good fellow silver simply round coins with the head of some monarch or other on them anybody may possess a five franc piece but do you suppose i carry five hundred francs about with me i should want a porter well leave them with your porter he is to be trusted i will call for them to-day no to-morrow i shall not have time to-day well to-morrow i will leave them when i go to auteuil may i depend on it certainly because i shall secure my housekeeper on the strength of it now see here will that be all and will you not torment me any more never caderousse had become so gloomy that andrea feared he should be obliged to notice the change he redoubled his gaiety and carelessness how sprightly you are said caderousse one would say you were already in possession of your property no unfortunately but when i do obtain it well i shall remember old friends i can tell you that yes since you have such a good memory what do you want it looks as if you are trying to fleece me i what an idea i who am going to give you another piece of good advice what is it to leave behind you the diamond you have on your finger we shall both get into trouble you will ruin both yourself and me by your folly how so said andrea how you put on a livery you disguise yourself as a servant and yet keep a diamond on your finger worth four or five thousand francs you guess well i know something of diamonds i have had some you do well to boast of it said andrea who without becoming angry as caderousse feared at this new extortion quietly resigned the ring caderousse looked so closely at it that andrea well knew that he was examining to see if all the edges were perfect it is a false diamond said caderousse you are joking now replied andrea do not be angry we can try it caderousse went to the window touched the glass with it and found it would cut confiture said caderousse putting the diamond on his little finger i was mistaken but those thieves of jewellers imitate so well that it is no longer worth while to rob a jeweller's shop it is another branch of industry paralyzed have you finished said andrea do you want anything more will you have my waistcoat or my hat make free now you have begun no you are after all a good companion i will not detain you and will try to cure myself of my ambition but take care the same thing does not happen to you in selling the diamond you feared with the gold i shall not sell it do not fear not at least until the day after to-morrow thought the young man happy rogue said caderousse 
"'You are going to find your servants, your horses, your carriage, and your betrothed.' "'Yes,' said Andrea. "'Well, I hope you will make a handsome wedding present, the day you marry Mademoiselle Donglars. "'I have already told you it is a fancy you have taken in your head.' "'What fortune has she?' "'But I tell you—' "'A million?' Andrea shrugged his shoulders. "'Let it be a million,' said Caderousse. "'You can never have so much as I wish you.' "'Thank you,' said the young man. "'Oh, I wish it you with all my heart,' added Caderousse with his hoarse laugh. "'Stop! Let me show you the way.' "'It is not worth while.' "'Yes, it is.' "'Why?' "'Because there is a little secret, a precaution I thought it desirable to take. One of Ure Efficet's locks, revised and improved by Gaspar Caderousse, I will manufacture you a similar one when you are a capitalist. Thank you, said Andrea. I will let you know a week beforehand. They parted. Caderousse remained on the landing until he had not only seen Andrea go down the three stories, but also across the court. Then he returned hastily, shut his door carefully, and began to study like a clever architect the plan Andrea had left him. Dear Benedetto, said he, I think he will not be sorry to inherit his fortune, and he who hastens the day when he can touch his five hundred thousand will not be his worst friend. End of chapter 81 So yes, apparently Caderousse is that stupid. I'm boggled. I am boggled. But he hasn't spent a lot of time around or spying on, evidently, the Count, so... I guess he doesn't know how stupid he is being, or, or else he really just is that stupid. Or smug. Or smug. Oy. But it, it does seem to me that Cavalcante may be setting up two people in this chapter. I can't tell yet if he really wants to go through with the marriage with Denglar's daughter. I mean, I know that for him it's a financial boon and all that, but. I can't tell if he's going to ditch her, get married, get money, and run, or if he's going to stick it out and be, you know, part of society and be the rich guy who's married to the rich girl. Although I'm sure she's not going to be thrilled either way. But then with Caderousse, it certainly seemed to me that he is planning something else. He gave over all that information so easily. But then, you know, he has his looks and his thinkings and... And I'm looking forward to seeing what happens next week when, yes, Caderousse actually attempts to rob the Count of Monte Cristo. I think we all can agree that that appears to be one of the most extraordinary acts of hubris that you could come up with. <laughs> You're bound to experience hubris kicking you in the tuchus. But nothing says Caderousse like, whoops, shouldn't have done that. Or as Thing One and I were talking yesterday, and I mentioned that the most often heard last words are, hey, watch this. And he laughed and he said, oh, I'd heard that the last words were, hold my beer. <laughs> ah, this is why I liked teaching high school, because we could say things like that to each other. And it's funny. So yeah, Kataru's famous last words. Eek. Uh, we did get a comment on the website this week from Katrin whose name is spelled beautifully. I love this. It's K-A-T-R-I-J-N. Love that. Uh, and she had written that she remembered the moment that I forgot. When we were talking a couple of weeks ago about Aide and how she seemed to be quite well aware of Albert and what she was doing when she was telling her story to him without using his father's name. Katrin mentioned that, yes, she absolutely knew who Albert was because at the opera, many, many, many chapters ago, Albert was looking at her and saw the Count point him out to her, and she got so upset she had to leave because foreshadowing. So, very cool. And thank you, Katrin, for writing in and reminding me of that. That was great. And I got a lovely voicemail that I'm going to play for you so that you can identify yourself and email me, heather at craftlit.com, and let me know who you are because you didn't tell me your name. 
there are many, many Craftlet listeners who I've been emailing with and corresponding with and chatting with for years now. And I tend to recognize the names, even if I haven't heard from you in a long time, I'll get an email and go, oh my gosh, I remember. I may not remember exactly what we had talked about before, but I remember your name. So I want to know who you are. But here is this lovely voicemail. Hi, I want to thank you for your podcast. I think it's wonderful. I recently um, discovered it about a year ago, and I have listened to it while I have crafted. Since I knit, I crochet, I quilt, I sew, and I just am always too busy to go to the library and pick up a book or go to the store and pick up a book. So this is just a blessing. I have started actually, I started from the beginning, and I've already got down to the current book, The Count of Monte Cristo. Thank you so much for this. It is just much appreciated. Thank you. Bye. So thank you. Thank you, mystery person, for that. Thank you all for supporting the show and for what we do and for loving classic fiction and for sharing it with your friends and your family and forcing craft lit on people right, left, and center. It means the world to me that you value this as much as I do. And on that note, I was working a lot on the website this week, and that is both good and bad. It is good because it is much faster now, or at least it should be. If it is not faster for you, you might want to clear your cache. Sometimes all that takes is holding down the shift key and refreshing the page, and that'll, it'll do kind of a lightweight version of clearing your cache just for that page. You may also have to clear your cache for real, and instructions for how to do that, you will have to Google because it changes depending on your browser. But I've also been working on setting up the membership pages, again, moving people over from the MailChimp slash PayPal centered framework for the downloading membership and moving it over all onto the craftlet.com site. I have been troubleshooting back and forth with several listeners who are having different issues getting into the downloading audio. The majority of people who've moved over, and thank you so much for doing that, the majority of people who've moved over to the craftlet.com premium audio membership have had no problems. Fantastic. We're trying to figure out what's causing problems for the, the few people who are stuck right now. The plugin that I'm using that allows us to do this membership part of the site is also allowing me to do a couple of add-ons. When everything is working well, you will see a member sign-in in the sidebar of the show notes. And I think that's going to be on the right hand from the main page. And then it'll switch to the left hand sidebar for post pages because there's only a left hand sidebar on post pages. So that member sign in should be available to you all the time from the sidebar. If you can't see it, clear your cache. Second thing is once you log in, you should be seeing your membership account page. From this page, you should be able to get to the download only page. You should be able to see your invoices. You should be able to see your membership card. I'm not kidding. I get to make you a membership card, which you can print if you want. And I'm so excited. And if you decide to do something like get the premium membership and the Brave New Podcast membership, which Again, we're still setting up. That one's a little bit more complicated, so I'm, I'm working on figuring that one out. You should be able to get it all from your account page. I am thrilled that I'm able to do this. It should make things so much easier for you. And that's it. I wanted to thank our patrons. We got many new patrons this last month, and their names are Deborah, Anya, Henrietta, Nina, Stuart, Donna, Linda, Sonia, Victoria, Kath, Kaylee, and Diana. Thank you so much for your support. A big thanks to all the Craftlet listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, Please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, 
at least you can turn one on.